Hello class, this is Roberts here, and today we're going to review the chapter regarding communication and personal identity. Let's begin. So, excuse me, we're going to review the following concepts. We're going to explore how the self is formed and how it changes, define the self and discuss the implications, examine the types of communication that influence our identities, and explore guidelines that will enrich who you are. <clears throat> All right. So first, let's understand what the self is. When we think of the self, I want you, or when we go over this chapter, I want you to think, uh, or ask yourself the question, who am I? And then you can go from there. This also will coincide with a project called the Autobiographical Poster, where you get to explore who you are, your goals, and your values. Excuse me. Okay. The self is an ever-changing system of perspectives and is formed with sustain and sustained communication with our, with others and ourselves. Again, it's an ever-changing system of perspectives and is formed and sustained in communication with ourselves and others. So when we think of who you are today versus who you were two years ago, five years ago, You've had new experiences, you've learned new things, especially through the college experience. You've achieved new goals, you created new goals to replace those goals. So the self is not the static thing. Now we do have parts of ourselves that are stable, like our personality, but our selves will change over time as we grow and as we and as you learn new things. So with the aspects of personal identity, we will go over a couple of theories that explain how our identity is formed, it's dynamic, it is influenced by our environment, our choices, our ability to make changes in our lives, and our goals who we want to be. And when you think of system and systems theory, the self is not, we, our self, ourselves, or our sense of self does not develop in a vacuum. We are first taught by our parents, our caregivers and loved ones, siblings, if we have any, our friends, our peer groups as we go through school. We might be shaped by our jobs, uh, the people that are in our orbit, mentors, our communities, our society. These, all these forces and all these factors influence who we are. And communication, and this is the focus of this class, is critically important because we need to have a safe space to communicate who we are. We need to be comfortable moving in our communities, in our world. And communication helps us define who we are and explain who we are to others. So there's many facts, facets to the self, who we physically are, what we look like, our abilities, how we moved throughout the world and how we're treated as our physical bodies move throughout the world. Our emotional states, shape who we are, our happy moments, our sad moments, and everything in between, our cognitive abilities, and our ways of processing stimuli in the world. Those things can shape who we are, and those things shape, those things change over time. We have society itself shaping who we are, defining who we are, and how we're labeled and moved throughout the world. And we also have individuals in our lives that help shape who we are, say our parents, our teachers, mentors, coaches, siblings, and the like. So to explore more how society shapes itself, and especially in American culture, 
we will have to talk about racial categories, gender identity, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic class. When we think of privilege, and or we think of those who might have lack of privilege, it can be a combination of these of these four. And there's more to society and demographics than these four. These are the top four we think about as far as defining who we are and how the world reacts to us. So when we think of racial identity and how people have been treated throughout this country based on racial identity, those same attitudes linger to this day. And that's what, as a society, we're trying to come to terms with and try to move forward and try to rectify. Then we have gender expression. In more recent years, as a society, we're questioning that if we have more than two genders, we have people of the non-binary and transgendered spectrum, we're moving towards understanding gender, gender, excuse me, gender as not a binary as male and female, but a spectrum. And, you know, there's a lot of heated debates about that. But how you identify as your gender, ginger, gender, excuse me, I keep saying ginger, I apologize. How your, your gender, gender identification, similar to other classifications, influence how you walk into the world and influences how people treat you in society. Sexual orientation is a, another identity that has come to the forefront in more recent decades versus previous decades where straight was the only social, excuse me, the only sexual orientation that was acceptable in society. Now we come to understand that sexual orientation is also a spectrum and people have multiple identities and those identities can change over time so just like we are exploring that gender isn't necessarily a binary type of situation we understand that sexual orientation encompasses more than people who identify as straight and we have the gamut for example lesbian bisexual gay excuse me pansexual and other types of sexual orientations. Then we have socioeconomic class. So this type of categorization can be more visible. And class, how class is defined in America is a little bit different than other countries. Um, we have an idea of a meritocracy, of a movement between classes. But we are also, as a country, are questioning, is that 100% true? Or how is class changing where, excuse me, how do we redefine, redefine the middle class as far as our economic situations are changing, especially for millennial and Gen Z and younger generations coming up? not necessarily have the same opportunities for financial prosperity as pre previous generations. How does our social economic, our sense of social economic self or sense of being in middle class change? We have our common classifications of social economic class, such as people who are working class, middle class, and those are separated into lower middle 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 upper middle and upper class and they have their own classifications but how you are classified in a socioeconomic class and your ability to move socioeconomic classes shapes who you are especially if you have to move up or if you move down so the self arises in communication with others and here are the ways that that can happen First, we have a reflected appraisal. It's our image of what others communicate about us. So if we're told that we are capable, that we are pretty or handsome, that we are worthy, 
then those reflected appraisals around us can help develop our sense of self. However, if we are taught negative, not necessarily not necessarily constructive criticism, that's something different. We are taking a, a we are giving a critical view of someone in a respectful way in order for them to identify a problem so they can improve it. But if people have negative reflective appraisals, people are saying that they aren't capable or they're ugly or they're dumb, then they will start to internalize that. So our self-image is partly a reflection of what others in society and our close ones feel about us and vice versa. We can affect, we can affect others' appraisals as well. Then we have labels that are direct reflection of behavior. So for example, if someone is labeled as smart, as dumb, as lazy, as hardworking, as studious, a loafer, those are direct definitions that we can internalize or that people have labeled us. Then we have self-fulfilling prophecies. These are the expectations of ourselves that influence our own actions. So say, for instance, you want to get a good grade in your math class, but you tell yourself that you're bad at math. When you demonstrate self-fulfilling prophecy, you may not go to tutoring or you may not study as hard because you're like, why bother? I'm bad at math. And then when you fail your math test, it confirms that you're bad at math. But what we didn't explore in between that is your behaviors that will lead to that conclusion. Or you can say, hey, I'm not great at math, but I'm really good at studying. So I'm going to use these skills of studying to get better at math. So you do go to the tutoring, you do study, you do talk to your professors, and you do pass that math class because you planted the seed initially saying, yes, I might not be the best at math, but I'm gonna overcome this by changing my study habits and using my study skills for this particular issue. Then the expectation came to pass. Next, we have social comparison. We rate ourselves in relation to others. And especially with the rise of social media, we have easier access to other people's lives. We have easier access to comparing ourselves to people in our families or cousins or just other people, right? So we evaluate how we're doing in life versus what other people are doing, how other people are doing in life. However, I want you to note, especially in social media or just in conversations with your family, people talk about or share their highlight reels. They don't talk about the struggles that they may have in between, the deficits they may have in between, or the struggles they may have in achieving those goals that you want. So make sure that in a moment of social comparison, make sure to have compassion for yourself and to know that these are highlight reels. And we don't know everything about the person, but you know all the good and bads about yourself. So make sure to have compassion for yourself. And finally, we have self-disclosure. So again, with social media, we have the ability to share more of ourselves with more people and with a wider audience of people. Or you can choose to be more private on social media and make sure to share what you want to your close loved ones. However, no matter what route you decide to choose, self-disclosure is the amount of information, the type of information we reveal about ourselves and others. We're going to continue with communication with family members. Family is so important because they are our first teachers and they influence and teach us how to move around the world and how we feel and how we feel about ourselves. 
So we have a lot of life scripts can be based on what we see in the household, what we see in our family. So the rules for living and identity, the values that you have for your family, some of the goals that you may have are influenced by family influences. For example, getting an education, getting a house, getting married. These things might be influenced by what the family wants as well. You adopt them for yourself. Then we also have attachment styles, which are views of ourselves versus our views of others. This can include secure attachment, dismissive, dismissive, excuse me, anxious and ambivalent, and fearful. So next, I'm going to show you a chart of what that looks like or how they how these definitions look in relation to each other. So we have the scale of low avoidance and high avoidance low anxiety and high anxiety. So for those who have secure attachments, they have low avoidance and low anxiety. So they have a more trusting and secure bond with the people around them. Whereas not people on the other end of the spectrum, at the end of the, excuse me, those on the other end of the spectrum have high avoidance. So they may not communicate as openly or freely but they have low anxiety, so they might not particularly care about making those connections. So on the other end of that spectrum is anxious. So they may not avoid communication, but they may have high anxiety around communication, or they might not feel as confident in communication situations. And then finally, you have the combination of anxious avoidance high anxiety about communication situations, and high avoidance in making those attachments. Next, we have the Jahari window. So if you think about the Jahari window, there are four parts or four panes in this window. Open, blind, hidden, and unknown. So on the four panes, we are describing how, what information we disclose to others and what information do we have access about ourselves. So open, in the, excuse me, the open pane in the Jahari window is the information that you freely know about yourself and you freely share with others. Blind is the information that others know about you, but you do not know about yourself. Hidden is the information that you have about yourself that you do not disclose to others. And unknown is information that you don't know about yourself and others do not know about you. So these unknown parts of ourself might come to the forefront eventually, but for right now, they're unknown to yourself and to others. Then we have a certain T reduction theory. So when we think about uncertainty and communication, especially when we're talking to others that we don't know or encountering situations we don't know, it falls on a spectrum to how we deal with that uncertainty. So initial encounters, of course, is very high because we don't know the person, so we don't know how they will react to us. Sometimes we might find it uncomfortable, but we can definitely reduce it with self-disclosure, with verbal, nonverbal body language, excuse me, nonverbal communication, and tone of voice, verbal communication, making sure to, to indicate that you're a safe person and that you are willing to get to know the other person. We disclose little bits of information in hopes that others will reciprocate and we can develop a rapport with the other person. So digital media and personal identity. So I briefly talked about it before as far as disclosure and comparison, but social media has definitely changed how much we share of ourselves and people even made money and branded how much they share about themselves. So we can have direct definitions 
and reflective appraisals of ourselves. Social media can be a key source of comparison, but remember you have to take that with a grain of salt because people show their highlight reels instead of everything in between. We can sculpt our presentation so we can use filters to make ourselves look great and we can have the right angles versus candid photos or the photos of the past where we had the actual physical photo didn't necessarily allow us to do that or and or we didn't we weren't able to share these images and these videos with a large amount of people so social media has definitely changed the game as far as disclosure the cells and defining ourselves and having more eyeballs <laughs> be able to peek in who we are and but fortunately you have the power to cultivate your image and you can decide how much you want to share with others so some final guidelines we want to make sure to reflect critically on social perspectives and understand how we move in the world and have compassion and understanding and be open to others experiences as well commit to personal growth and just be fair and compassionate to yourself create supportive context for change and don't self-sabotage make sure that you are compassionate for any mistakes that you make but be open to growth as you change because the only constant in life is change and we change as people but we do have certain constants such as personality but you can shape who you are so let me go ahead and pose up all right so today we talked about personal identity and how communication influence personal identity of course let me know if you have any questions thank you so much for joining me today and i will see you next time bye